Fantastic series talking about the meaning of baptism and then today the meaning of Eucharist. Um, of course, in our tradition, they are fundamental, and at the same time, we don't often unpack some of the meanings. So as Jesse and I were talking with some others who are on the formation advisory, they said, offer two series. We, um, you know, we knew that it was falling, no pun intended, at fall break, so that also um, affects attendance, but I'm glad that we're here and we get to have a conversation. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of this time in this space for us to gather and reflect on the meaning and practice of Holy Communion. Thank you for those who are joining us via live stream who may watch this at another time to go deeper into this part of our tradition. Be with us here at Grace St. Luke's and throughout the world where we gather at table as a time of healing and transformation. We are especially mindful today of the war and unrest in Israel and the Middle East, mindful of churches that are prayerful places of gathering, offering the sacrament to memorialize those who have died there and throughout the world. Be with us here in our own space, and may we give thanks for this opportunity that we have as Anglicans and Episcopalians. In Christ's name, amen. So just, just a few things contextually. Um, some of you, just curiously, who was around last Sunday at the 1030 service? So we are on a two-week series, and we'll do this some more throughout the year, of having what's called an instructed Eucharist. Uh, many, many years ago, um, it was mentioned that we might do this and have it in writing. And so if you have your leaflet from last week, and it's again in today's leaflet, the, it has columns on both sides that walks through the details of what's called the Liturgy of the Word. And then today, it's picking up with the Liturgy of the Table. So it's a good, uh, several people after the service took five and ten copies to go and share with friends because it's a detailed history of what we are doing throughout the service. So that'll be at the announcements at the beginning of the service to just say, where does this come from? How do we select the things that we do, not just here at Grace St. Luke's, but historically? So I just wanted to call attention to that. But meaning and practice, um, some of the things here, I've got a few slides to lead us through. That is their um, a, a Coptic chalice and paten, and it has a slotted spoon. Um, you might be wondering, why is there a, a crown on top? Does anyone have a sense of where, why there might be a crown that's over as a part of that, that decoration? Anyone just have any thoughts on why that would even exist? So some theology around king of king, lord of lords. Also the practical of protecting the bread <laughs> from falling out if you weren't using hosts. So it was another way literally to have the bread in there and you topped it and you pulled pieces from it um, within that. So that's just one of the, um, but the slotted spoon of course is there to help when there is um, extra bread floating in the chalice that that is what that is for, to help lift out, and which we have here. Um, some people have never seen it used, but we have slotted spoons that are next to the chalice so that when there's bread that someone has dropped, there is a way to please join us on this side, on the front row. Welcome. Um, and <laughs> front row in the classroom. Yes, thank you. Hello, Allison. Yes, no. um, but that is, that is just something about the slotted spoon, so. Well, I thought it would, let's see. Might, uh, okay, so um, some of this, last week, Jesse led us in a conversation about the, the meaning of baptism, and we talked last week that a sacrament and outward and visible signs of inward and spiritual grace given by Christ is sure and certain means by which we receive that grace. So that's prayer book language for the sacraments. And um, we then talk about the seven classic sacraments 
in Anglicanism and in our Episcopal tradition, we have what's called gospel sacraments, and then we have the lesser sacraments. And by this, gospel sacraments, baptism and Eucharist, mean that those come directively and verbatim from Scripture. Those would be the essentials, as it were. But then the lesser sacraments are things that bring us more into the relationship of the church, um, confirmation, reconciliation, unction, marriage, and ordination. Dan. Yes. So if you go into, when you go into the East transept, and as soon as you just over by where the piano is, if you walk in that area, you'll be able to see, um, see how they're all captured there. Uh, it's a, um, that, and we haven't done this in a long time, and I know Dan would probably be willing to do it. We haven't done a Windows tour in a long time of talking through our windows. And I know that sometime, how long ago was that, that that was offered? I mean, it was even before I came. I mean, it's been... Okay. So I'd be interested to see, but there's so much symbolism and meaning that's in our window, so... So we're in Scripture, the Synoptic Gospels. We have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, have versions that point to why we have this practice. Um, some people will often um, just want to know the source of that. Um, and then in Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians, and all of that, of course, is basically in one way or another saying, take, eat, this is my body, take, drink, this is my blood, do this in remembrance. Um, the meaning behind that, of course, goes into what we then see, especially if you start to think about uh, Holy Week, um, particularly Monday, Thursday, when we receive the, lo the, the love commandment on that evening, but we also are intentional to talk about um, communion because we are real Christians gathered in that moment on the night before our Lord's death um, to memorialize um, that time and to remember that. But um, that is where that comes, so the sacramental or memorial reenactment, basically, of the Last Supper, Jesus and 12 disciples on the night before his crucifixion. So contextually, um, of course, that comes from Scripture. So a little bit about the word Eucharist. Um, it comes from the Greek word Eucharistia, um, which is the earliest historical use, which really means Thanksgiving. So if you've noticed in the service and the top of the, of where it talks about after it says the offertory, the first thing you see is the great thanksgiving. The great thanksgiving is another way of saying Eucharist. So that is where, why we call that the great thanksgiving. Um, and then communion from the Latin word communio, which basically means sharing in common, used with different meanings by Catholics and Orthodox Christians, Anglicans, many Protestants, including Lutherans, who practice communion a lot. So we'll focus some on, on just what, where some of this comes from and how different people talk about it. The Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread, again, from the New Testament in 1 Corinthians and then in Acts. And then another part in Acts, all applied to the celebration of the Eucharist. So the names are important. Um, so when people, but in our secular world, or just in the world as we know it, most people don't know what Eucharist means. So if you think about a moment of evangelism, right? If you just have Eucharist, Eucharist, Eucharist showing up everywhere in your signage, or on your website, and you're trying to invite others, most people don't know, and we even have, and it's happened in churches, Grace St. Luke's and others, people will call and say, what is that? Because it's not a word that's so familiar if you're not in traditions that receive it, right? And so um, I have many friends, they will sometimes ask me, when's the season of Eucharist? Like they think that it's a completely different, it's not connected to bread and wine or Holy Communion. It's that foreign of a word. So I'm often thinking about, and Lucy, who's here, our communications associate, when we talk a lot about when we communicate things, right, 
do people understand the words that we use? We understand it as Episcopalians, but out there in the world, when you say, I'm going to the Eucharist at 4 o'clock today, that stare that your coworker gives to you or your neighbor, and maybe you ask them, do they know what it is, or maybe we don't, right? So, um, and then other phrases used to describe it, the table of the Lord, um, the Lord's body, um, and then the holy of holies. So, references to it being a most sacred time, right? So, a lot of the, the theology comes from some of the words that you will look at there. So, given some precursors and looking back in what's called Jewish and even pagan antecedents, um, Melchizedek, we hear that word, of course, a lot. Some know more about the story than others, but in the Torah, um, the priest Melchizedek who brought bread and wine to Abraham after Abraham's victory over the four kings, besieged Sodom and Gomorrah, and taken Abraham's nephew Lot prisoner. Christians, and this shows up a lot, we start to hear this, particularly uh, around um, Holy Week, when we're building up the credibility, which the people were doing centuries ago to try and give Jesus some credibility for him to be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, was to show that he was of royalty of sorts, that he was of the most important because people were still divided, right? They didn't understand him. So anything that could be used to describe him more, that was one of the examples. Um, the Passover, of course, at Passover celebrations, there's a blessing and partaking of bread and wine is basic to that grand feast. And then the Last Supper was basically a Passover Seder. So what they were doing that night was culturally, no, that was a norm. That was a norm of gathering in that way. Um, but we today, you know, trying to make sense of that, and there are a lot of places that, of course, in synagogues who observe seders. And then there have been some Christian communities who have attempted to have seders. And um, some say that Christians should be doing that as a way of respect, and others feel strongly that it is not something um, that Christians should try and mimic because of the meaning of it, you know. And so I don't know your, your thoughts on that. I'm often curious. Do you have personal thoughts on should Christian communities, and there have been articles written about it, and others have very strong feelings as to why we shouldn't have satyrs, like if Grace St. Luke's wanted to have a satyr, um, should we do that? I'm just curious of things that maybe you've been to satyrs before in Christian communities. Any first reactions to that or from observations? I think the, the idea of building, if it would help us building bridges mm -hmm. to other groups, Okay, yeah, I, I think that's a that's a positive, right? And it's something that not everybody needs to participate in if they choose not to, right? So, and that has been some of the reasons that places have done it was to see it as a form of community. Any, any others, uh, Dan? Well, I, it shouldn't come as any big surprise to everybody that Jesus was Jewish. Mm -hmm. He died Jewish. Mm -hmm. So, I mean. I think the, the bridge there is, is a fairly obvious one to me that, that we should be doing those sorts of things okay. to try. And to tr because we're picking up a lot of our traditions, as you're showing today, from that faith. Right. So understanding that is right. important. That's I think Mike has talked about that a number of times, too. Yes, yes. And one of the most memorable yeah. mm -hmm. experiences in my life was attending a church in southwest D.C., in 1986, seven or eight, which was St. Augustine's Episcopal and Temple Micah. We shared the facility, and it was a church in the round similar to the original Holy Apostles here, and you had a three-step uh, platform on which there was a altar table with a bronze uh, Alpha and Omega holding it up, and behind it were the tabernacle on which there was a portable cross that would come in and out, huh. and all of the 
holy books of the Jewish faith behind, and we had the best sailor there ever was. Okay. And nice. I will always remember that as being an extremely powerful event. Okay. Thank you. I was thinking, Jesse, have you been in a parish that's had satyrs? Um, I've been in parishes that have had them before. I'm just often curious of people's contexts. Um, my parish growing up did it. So, and how, how did they, how did that, how was it received in the parish? And you were um, Roman? Yeah, parishioners seemed to be really excited about it. Um, it was often hundreds of people. It felt very different to me. I also grew up with a good friend who was Jewish, so I would go over to her house for Pesach every year, and it had a very different feel than Pesach with the Namius family. Right, you know, so yeah. But yeah. Any others? Um, Mir? Okay. Okay, okay. So right, yeah. I've um, I've heard that Grace St. Luke's has offered satyrs before, and when I was in Charlotte, the parish, one year did, one year didn't. It wasn't a consistent thing, but I've 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 been to them before. But it's always interesting when it comes up, and then, and then there are those who um, who are Jewish who feel strongly that we shouldn't do it, and don't see it as a bridge builder, depending on who you ask. So it's an interesting depends on who you ask. Uh, and even as Christians who who feel strongly the same way, too. So I'm always just curious when people gather to talk about satyrs um, is what, what the thinking is. Any other comments before we move on? Okay. Um, so then if we look back into some of the Greek um, texts or Greek history, um, sacramental partaking of, um, you know, looking at the Bacchic and the Dionysian rites, um, with wine signifying the spirit and bread was the manifestation of the spirit in the matter of the body. And so elements of Greek thanksgiving, again, going back to that word, Eucharistia, um, which we get Eucharist has been adopted, of course, in early centuries of Christian era for the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So um, I'm reminded if we go back in church history and talk about what's called catechetical history, so much of what we do and so much, of course, what's in Scripture, um, which, of course, was in Hebrew and then in Greek, um, the way we receive the New Testament and some of the customs that we now have today, they go back to Greek tradition. So when we talk about how did we evolve, uh, it, it, it involves a non-Christian, there's some, a lot of non-Christian heritage <laughs> in that that we now hold so high and dear, which I find very interesting when we are very um, obviously good at distancing ourselves from those who are non-believers, right? And yet so much of what we do as Christians comes out of Greek heritage and Greek culture. And so I just find that interesting when we are being very judgmental against the non-Christians um, and particularly in, in more um, fundamentalist spaces, to be very clear about those lines of distinction, and yet what we do and what places do to gather for worship comes often out of Greek traditions and Greek customs. So that's always just an interesting kind of, um, I'd call it a um, kind of a paradox that takes place uh, in that moment. So. So, um, talking about just a bit about Orthodox and Roman and Anglican and Protestant. So, the center of worship um, for our tradition today, especially if you think about the history of the 1979 prayer book. Um, the 79 prayer book in particular moved the Eucharist to be the principal service of the life of the church. That was a very, very intentional, even as the daily office of morning prayer, noonday prayer, evening prayer, Compline, um, even song, those customs of matins. So people growing up, I'm looking at Simon growing up in the UK, things that were just daily life in a community. And even in the Episcopal Church up to the 1979 prayer book, 
morning prayer. Who grew up on morning prayer? Okay, and then over time, morning prayer still continued in some parishes, um, and communion would be once a month. So who remembers? Actually, just let's just take a moment, because this is helpful for some people who are newer to the tradition. What was your custom growing up between morning prayer and eventually going to its Eucharist every week? Let's start with Dan. So Lucy's going to come because we're recording it too. Oh, okay. So sorry, yeah. Uh, in my experience, we never went to Eucharist every week. We at St. John's where I where I started, it was morning prayer three three weekends, and then it was Eucharist, and okay. the same thing at Holy Communion later. Okay, so you're from when you were born, the norm no. was morning prayer. Right. So what do you remember about the shift? from one norm to the next, well, just I, even you personally. I don't even remember that because when I went away to college, they were still doing it that way. Okay. At Holy Communion. And then, and then after 1979, what, where were you in life at that point when was the Eucharist here. was, you were here by then? Okay. And what was this parish's, even at 1979, what was this parish's practice around communion and morning prayer? Do you remember what the norm we, was? We were doing communion every week. Okay, at that uh, point. And th then, we, of course, we were going through the experience of the new prayer book okay. and so on. Okay. And that, we joined in 74, so okay. it was... So you watched it sort of shift. Watched quick. it shift. Any yeah. others? I see, um, Ruthie, where, what was your custom of morning prayer and then Eucharist? The same as Dan's. Okay. Um, I grew up in Knoxville, and... Got to Memphis in 83 and got to Gray St. Luke's in the 90s. So Eucharist was, was already, in, okay. At school here. Okay. And Mackie, what was your, your practice of when you came into the Episcopal Church, depending on what year? Well, I, uh, I'm a transformed Episcopalian. I grew up in the Baptist Church and uh, then married in the Episcopal Church and like Dan, pretty well followed uh, the leadership of originally Calvary and later Grace St. Luke. So uh, uh, to be honest, I, I, I didn't have a basis for comparison. Okay, so. okay. Yeah, yeah, that's just helpful. Um, others who might remember just how the shift changed. Some people can poignantly remember what it was like to go from morning prayer all the time, almost, <laughs> to Eucharist. And some people still struggle with and their thoughts on the Eucharist is often connected to the feelings around the daily office and the Eucharist and some say they're the same some say we should do more still more morning prayer that their hearts are more morning prayer focused and Eucharist comes so any any others um, John or what you grew up in well I I grew up in Birmingham and uh followed the pattern of uh, three Sundays was morning prayer and then uh, Eucharist. And I can't remember exactly when the change, but I remember uh, not liking the change because it seemed to me that that once a month made it a little bit more special. Okay. And that, so what John just described is something that I still hear a lot today from our own parishioners and non-parishioners who are Episcopalians that, um, that they miss the morning prayer rhythm and that when Eucharist comes, it always feels more special, but they also acknowledge that that's just not the custom, that's not the norm. There are few parishes around the country where morning prayer is still observed, uh, like on first and third is morning prayer and second and fourth is communion. And you can find a few places, including when I lived in Charlotte, um, there are a few parishes there that still observe the morning prayer, Eucharist kind of custom. Any others, Gro? What do they do during the summer? Or in the summer. So in the summer, they might have a moment as another way to gather people to go back to some of the customs that were less familiar. I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, but growing up, some people were born only into when the Eucharist was there. Would you be mind just speaking about that custom growing up? Just so the 
I was three when the new prayer book came out, so I don't remember anything okay. other than that. Um, <clears throat> growing up in the Episcopal Church, I don't remember Eucharist not being a part of regular worship, and I may offend some people when I say this, feeling disappointed when I would come to church and it was morning prayer. Mm -hmm. So Allison sentiments, so there are a lot of people when we have on occasion, these have been rare moments, right? When people showed up expecting Eucharist. Yeah, it was a strange moment and sometimes even a phone call. <laughs> yeah, or an email. Like I arrived to the service and, oh, did it time out, Lucy? Um, and so arrived to the to the service and they had something else happening so that was always an interesting moment to to see to see how that would go over to um, Jonathan Okay, okay. I mean, we would come out on Sunday and, you know, I can't, it wasn't morning prayer, but we did, but we didn't have the version of the prayer book. We didn't have the Eucharist in Sunday morning for anybody to have it. Right. And we're in here? Well, yeah, what was, was it communion every week in here? So Simon, I'm thinking in the UK, when when and what was your um, practice growing up? To be honest, I, I, I don't remember as well as I should do. It's been a long time. But uh, for us, even from I was going to say in in a family, and I think maybe as a tradition, perhaps even song was really our main service that I remember going to, and uh, have I have a particular soft spot for even song maybe as a result of that right uh, and um so obviously there was no not obviously but there was no eucharist in the even song right um, but that was the main service that i used to attend right and what simon's describing one thing that's a custom in some places um in the uk and in the states is after even song at a side chapel the eucharist was offered um, there's still several places when i'm traveling and going to other cities um, is immediately after the service in the side chapel, you can go for typically, and it's a ten, it's not a 30 minute Eucharist, but if you arrived expecting it, it's still available because there is enough cultural tie to the Eucharist that it's still available even for even song, you know, so you could literally just exit to the side and keep going. So, yeah. Um, let's see, I can just use my, if it did it. Yes. Question. Um, what do uh, uh, marriage services like? I know that they said maybe they did some taking steps, but the stuff for the, the bride and groom or family or maybe the minister being involved in the decision as to whether or not Eucharist is part of the marriage ceremony. Is there some. So it, it's and so um, it's I'm smiling because it raises a lot for it depends on the families. Uh, it depends on um, what some families have intended for the day and what they thought that should look like. That's the best way for me to to put that because um, sometimes it's a time thing, believe it or not. Um, people have it in their mind that the wedding should last 25 minutes because the reception has to start at a certain time. Our custom here now at Grace St. Luke's is that all weddings include the Eucharist, and that's up front. So when families are planning, it's included. 
And the only reason that we haven't included it was during COVID, because we had certain restrictions. And brides and grooms, couples were very, very grateful that it was something that we had taken on, but sometimes they had to go and discuss that with family who maybe had a different opinion. So you have the, the couple that feels that this is wonderful, right? <laughs> and you go back and talk to the family that's helping plan with you, and they'll say, and I don't think our guests have time for that, or I don't think there are traditions that believe in that, and it becomes, it does become a very interesting um, conversation. So just, um, and it, it literally from wedding to wedding. I'm looking at Laura, who's in the back. She's been to both and officiated both, and it has a lot of varying factors. But our norm, our custom here has now included Eucharist, um, but then there have been some cases when we haven't, and couples have been glad that we did. Um, but in some cases, there's been some um, convincing on some family members. And then even after that, those family members were glad that they did and found it to be a very meaningful service to watch the couple begin their new life um, in communion with others. And the same for funerals. So funerals, the same. Um, So, so John raises a point about the number of people who aren't familiar with it will often influence the family's thoughts on what to do. Um, yeah. And some people clear that they know they're having it, which is, this is a plug for everybody to fill, we need to send out a reminder, everybody do your forms, your planning forms, because where families fight, believe it or not, at funeral planning time, is around these sorts of things not being decided. And you will have um, family members who've decided what they want, but the person who died was very clear about what they wanted. And if it's not, if we don't have it here at the church, it makes for an interesting, yeah, and literally fight. It's not, I don't mean like an unsettled, it's a, it can be tense, tent, very tense, so. Um, it's okay. So I'm just going to um, highlight some things here um, in talking about the, um, the bread and wine partaking in the body and blood of Christ, um, the cup of blessing partaking in the blood, articles of religion. If you've heard about the articles of religion for the Episcopal Church, there are 39 articles that raise up a lot of attention to the importance of um, taking communion. So that goes back to 1571. And that part of our tradition, that there is a lot of speaking to the fact that that is another um, powerful way for the church to be together. And it even says that um, the articles say that those who receive unworthily do not actually receive Christ, but rather their own condemnation. That's kind of harsh, watching your faces. But basically what that means is um, when people are carrying a lot of hate and evil in their heart and yet coming and receiving communion and still plan to carry the hate and evil in their heart, um, the thinking is that you might not, you're not right yet. Some say, but go take it anyway and it could fix it, right? <laughs> it depends on who you ask. But it is, it, it does raise a very, I would say, an important question is when, when um, someone's very clear on how they feel about something and so, and say it's something very deeply evil and they're going to still come and receive, which is the ultimate thing of healing and wholeness and love and um, I don't know, it's a, I don't know if you have, do you have reactions to that, thoughts about that? Because that is one of those where the church is constantly in conflict around who receives communion. And in some parishes and dioceses and things that it's very clear that if, if um, someone is in a place of constant evil and it's so publicly known that they can be refused communion. 
that's actually in our prayer book. So it's, it's, it's something that you don't see happen, <laughs> but it's there. Any reactions to that? It's just in our Anglican history, but I'm always, again, curious. We can keep going, but I just thought I would ask. Any reactions to that? Okay. R- Ruthie? I would say we were really denying power of the public meeting. Right. I mean, no, that's, again, that's, that's how it ends up that you don't find yourself doing the refusal based on what Ruthie just said, but then others feel differently about it. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So John gave an example where he was in a community where he was not right with that place, and it felt, it felt disingenuous. And I, I, I actually do know, and some parishioners have said before, you may have noticed I didn't take communion for the last two weeks. I was like, well, it, I don't always notice, but I do in that moment notice that if someone's not receiving, but I don't, I don't start to think of why. Sometimes it's health. Um, so yeah, there are lots of reasons in the moment, but some will say, um, can, I, can we talk? And sometimes it's because they're very unsettled or troubled by something and don't feel. And they grew up in a setting where you were um, taught and told that until you're at some place where you feel more at peace, that yes, you should. But if you feel too unsettled or you're carrying too much, even though the Holy Spirit could do something with that, if that person is carrying that so heavily, they've made a decision to not to not receive, and some have been wanted, have wanted to, which I appreciate, wanted to pastorally reflect on that. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. Um, So here, Anglicans and Episcopalians um, believe in consubstantiation, which is the real presence. So that's basically kind of a part of the topic today is the real presence. Um, do, what do we believe when we say real presence? What does that mean um, of Christ? Um, in our tradition, we say that it's less about the specifics of belief and more about power and mystery and that real people, because real people are gathered for a feast of God's table like real people gathered with Jesus on the night before he died. And it's done in memory of Jesus. It brings Christ present in a way that is indescribable and more than symbolic. So those are just some points about the word real presence. Um, Have any of you had conversations about transubstantiation, where we hear the term mostly out of Roman Catholicism, and then um, in Anglicanism, others will hear the term consubstantiation. Um, and you may have your own thoughts on that, um, about that understanding of the real presence. Um, but And Lucy's going to come with the mic and just capture any thoughts you might have, but about the meaning of the real presence of Christ. And maybe in use, I'd say even I statements, because you are people who've been receiving communion for a long time, maybe just speak for a moment about what that moment is like for you. Putting Ellen on the spot, because she was looking, yep. Well, that's really why I came today, because I had, I had a mystical experience once. Hold it up to you. I had a mystical experience once at the altar here. Okay. Doing uh, communion, and there was a presence. Okay, thank you. Others who receive communion a lot, what, what's happening in that moment for you? What, um, Dan, yeah. A, a sense of peace. Okay. Uh, that in my case, I mean, that's why, I mean, just sort of an overriding sense of peace okay. in a moment. In that, in that particular in moment. In that particular moment okay. that you hope carries over and moves you through, but always a, a, a sense of peace. Okay, thank you. Others? Anybody want to share? 
We don't have to, but okay. I'll just speak for me personally. Um, that sense of the real presence um, was what drew me from Methodism into Roman Catholicism into the Episcopal Church. That deepest meaning of mystery, that indescribable moment of um, trying to imagine having gathered with Jesus the night before he died. And that was a group of sinners who gathered with him the night before he died. And my, myself, a sinner, gathered with other sinners <laughs> to be in this really powerful moment of what I call where it's just a leveling. For me, I call the Eucharist a moment where it is just a clean slate in that moment, everyone in the truest sense. That one moment is so different from any other moment for, for me in the whole service. That's the one moment when things where the peace can come out of consuming um, bread and wine uh, in memory of the one who calls us to peace and justice and love and all of that. And so I was looking for that. I didn't have those words at the time, but my grandfather, a lot of you have heard me speak about, who was United Methodist clergy, and he said, you're going to end up in the Anglican tradition because you've got a higher sense of this than Methodists do, and you're going to get tired of the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> so the Anglican Episcopal Church will be that balance for you because of what you're describing. And my parents saw the same thing, too. I was taking music lessons at the Episcopal Church, and I was around it a lot, but I was still in this Methodist and Roman Catholic world. So it was not until college. I'm looking at Alice, and I became an Episcopalian at St. James in Jackson, Mississippi. But when I arrived there, I was a Roman Catholic and became an Episcopalian through so much of Eucharist and community and conversation and things like that. So I, I, um, it's not a symbolic moment for me. But I understand practically <clears throat> why people say it's symbolic because um, it's not like we were there that long ago. We weren't the people who gathered, right? Or for the thinking and some of the thinking of consubstantiation, even though this doesn't literally mean this, but in teachings of Roman Catholicism, and I had a seminary professor who used to say um, that for... Roman Catholics, and he was being extremist when he said this, is that for Roman Catholics, if you put a microscope over that bread, it has turned into flesh. I was like, really? Come on. That's not, but that was, he was trying to show that it is that other. It is that different. And so I do actually believe that that bread and wine become other. It's not the same bread and wine that's just in a backpack because you went to the store and brought it in and loaded it up. You know, it, it's, it's, you're not handling it with care until it's consecrated, if that makes sense. It then changes. So that's just my... What happens to what is left over? So, um, so that's called the ablutions. The ablutions is consuming the bread and wine or putting extra bread and wine in the ombre or tabernacle. Um, it's also, I'm looking at Lillian Trotter who's on the altar guild, um, is that um, when it's overflowing with extra, there's some moments when um, altar guild member goes out and it goes out to the birds because it's literally just overflowing with so much extra that, you know, you're communing with the, with the birds, as it were. Um, in the sacristy, um, some of you know the word piscina. The piscina is actually a holy drain that literally goes into the ground. So any unconsecrated wine that's not consumed is poured into this. If you go in our sacristy, if you're looking at the main sink, there's a small round sink off to the right. And some, it even has a cover over it. Ours doesn't and you pour the wine and it goes straight into the ground, going back to the real presence piece that you just wouldn't pour it in with your normal sewage. So yeah, right. So 
um, let's see, other Protestants, just thinking about others, um, kind of, you know, talk about communion in different ways. Um, it is very, for some, very symbolic. It does not have the weight, I would say, the heaviness. And this is from my fellow Protestants who talk about this a lot, that it is dif deeply meaningful. But the way we experience it often in our tradition, they say that we have a higher regard for it. So a lot of this is their words and their beliefs around that. So, And then this is just our last here. Just um, who can receive open or closed communion? Um, in our tradition, we believe that all baptized Christians may receive Holy Communion because the sacrament of Holy Baptism is full initiation into the life and customs of the church. So we believe that strongly. Um, but then there are others who believe, um, particularly Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox traditions, who exclude non-members. And we'll say that in their bulletins. We'll say that. Um, who asked about communion at funerals? Was it someone a minute ago? But at funerals even, if you've been to a service that's a mass, um, depending on the parish, right, the person who's talking about what's next will be very clear um, as to who can receive. Um, so weddings, same thing at weddings, too. Yeah. And then some Protestants, including us, um, practice open communion, which is an ongoing debate throughout the church. And we talked about this last week, is that um, the thinking is that if baptism is full initiation... Communion, then, is a part of that, and the thinking is, if someone is not baptized, that what is theologically behind receiving, that they should not receive. Not to say that they cannot become baptized and receive, but the thinking is, um, if, if, if they are not approaching it with some level of, this has meaning for me in my heart, that's more than just gathering before a meal with friends, don't get me wrong, the thinking is that that is why that they, um, and the Episcopal Church's official position is for baptized, but there are some places that still, anyway, <laughs> have open communion, um, some parishes, some dioceses, but the church's official position is based on baptism, so. So I'll stop there. Um, we've got a few, we are basically over time. And thank you for, for gathering today. Um, and then if you're going to be at the next service, um, to just um, follow, follow on your leaflet, and there'll be a lot of historical information. So thank you.